walked in this morning and uh, the tree was up and we've got decorations on the window and the candelabra up here and it, it really tells you that it's it's Christmas you know the the wreath up here the wreaths outside you you know when you walked in that something was different and when something was different uh, uh, visually something the way that we see things uh, we also do different things you know we call this season by a fancy name we call it Advent and all that means is coming. We, we as Christians have appropriated that word and we make it to mean that the Lord is coming. Now the first advent was the anticipation of the Messiah coming, the anticipation of Jesus' birth. And so for four weeks, there's no magic to this number, but for four weeks we prepare ourselves for the Messiah's arrival. Now, we being a non-liturgical church, we don't treat the season as a penitent season. By that I mean we don't we don't treat it in the same way that we do with Lent. We are not uh, going about the business of purifying ourselves in anticipation of Jesus coming. Uh, we are not abstaining from things. We go really the opposite way. We uh, exhibit a lot of joy. We, we change the music that we sing. We change the decoration of the sanctuary. We do a lot of things that are more celebratory uh, than some of our liturgical brothers and sisters would do. And that's good and bad. You know, we, we bring all these things into the sanctuary and they all uh, compete for attention with the cross. So good and bad. We, we, bring, this, uh, we bring this candle in and by, by the end of the four weeks it'll be this huge bonfire of flame uh, and, and it can be distracting. It can draw our attention away from God's word. But we've been doing this for a number of years and we have trained ourselves to pay attention despite all of the potential distractions that that come about. When we are non-liturgical, when we are not being penitent, uh, we don't prepare ourselves for Christmas. Well, we do. We shop and we eat uh, and we have parties and things like that. But what I mean is we don't spiritually prepare ourselves. And for that, we are the poorer. When you are preparing yourself for Advent, you are putting yourself in the mindset that you are awaiting the arrival of Christ. As the days count down towards Christmas Day, you are anticipating to a greater and greater degree the arrival of the birth of Jesus Christ. And we don't have to be, we don't have to be penitent in order to do that. We can just be mindful that we are looking forward. We can do the best that we can to put ourselves in the shoes of those who were in the first century. Remember that in the first century, when the, when the Advent is actually occurring, they were a people with no hope. You know, between the end of the Old Testament and the birth of Christ, we call that the dark period. We call that the dark years because God stopped speaking. God stopped communicating with the people of the world. Israel had so diminished and had been exiled and had reduced itself down to uh, the remnant that the Bible talks about. It was without land. It was without a power. It was out without anything. They had no hope. They're looking forward to this Messiah and God won't speak to them. He doesn't send any prophets to them. They get no word. They are just basically going through the motions. Now imagine if you are one of God's people and he stops speaking to you for a week, for a month, maybe for an entire year, God stops speaking to you and then multiply that times 400. You would begin to doubt the promises of God. You would begin to look at what God had said he would do, at what God said he would deliver, at what he had done in the past and what he's not doing now, and you would really feel like your hope was gone, like there really was nothing coming. 
But then something starts to happen. God begins to awaken the hearts of, of some people, not of all people, but of some people. Some people begin to sense that something is going to change. Some people begin to get advance notice that John the Baptist would be born, that his cousin Jesus would be born. Mary is given a word that says, you, you of all people have been chosen to be the mother of the Son of God. And, and, and now, little by little by little, God is beginning to give this word, and that hope is beginning to grow and grow and grow. And they're watching. Mary's watching her stomach expand. John the Baptist is born, and then a little bit later, Jesus is born. So, you know, this is going on and on, and the hope is beginning to grow and grow and grow. And then, of course, just like the songs that we sang, Jesus is born. And he enters the world and all hope and all peace and all joy and all love is bound up in him. And it's one thing for me to say that. It's one thing for me to just say those words. But the other thing that changes when the tree comes into the sanctuary is we begin to sing different songs. You know, we sing a lot of praise music and a lot of hymns during the year. But during this period, we pull out a very small subsection of songs that we don't sing at any other time of the year. It's Christmas songs, right? Christmas songs, we bring these out. And for the praise team, it's an interesting experience because the other songs we rotate and we sing and we learn new songs, we do this, but once a year, we pull out that super secret folder of Christmas songs and we open them up. And what's amazing about that, what's amazing about music in general, is that you know almost every one of those songs by heart, right? You know the melody. As soon as you get the first few notes, the first couple of bars of the song, you know what song we're singing. Most of the songs that we sing, especially the hymns, most of those songs, you can close your eyes and sing those words because you have sung them over and over and over. What's interesting about Christmas music, as opposed to the praise music that is also familiar to us, is that people outside of the church know those songs as well. They don't seem to know what they mean. Some of the words, you know, they may only know the first verse of the song, but they know all those songs. And as soon as you hear the first few notes of those songs, you begin to sing. Christmas music is very special. It's generally all in a major key. It's all upbeat. It's all filled with these messages of joy and hope and peace and, and all, of the, all of the wishes, all of the thoughts that we bring to bear during the Christmas season. And it's special for one reason. Because it has as its purpose the bringing up of hope. The rising of hope. As we sing these songs, we are reminded over and over and over in different ways and in different words the, the hope that's coming. The hope that is entering the world in the form of that baby Jesus Christ. And no matter what's going on around us, no matter what we're facing, no matter what trials, tribulations, troubles that come into our life, you hear those words of any of these Christmas songs and you are lifted up and you realize there is a greater hope, a greater hope of which you are a part of it. One of the great hymns that we sing at this time of year is Joy to the World. In your hymnal, it's number 194. Joy to the World and what's the rest of it? Well, it's written on the wall. That's not up here. Joy to the World, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Now listen, everybody in the world knows that. Everybody knows at least that verse. They may know nothing that follows after that, but they know that verse. And if that's all anybody ever hears, if that's the only Christmas song that we ever said, look at all the hope that is bound up in that. Mm -hmm. That God's long-awaited promises, that what God had promised from eons ago was about to come true. And not only was Jesus coming into the world, not only was the Messiah coming to this world, that Messiah is the King. 
That Messiah is going to exercise authority over everything. That Messiah is going to be the agent through which everything is set straight. That's a message of hope. That is an incredible message of hope. We sing that song. We memorize that song. We, we live that song. You want to know something about that song? When it was written, that song was controversial. You think that we have worship music wars today. This is nothing compared to what went on when that song was written. That song was written by Isaac Watts. Isaac Watts. Now, you may not, that, that may, name may mean nothing to you. But if you're ever bored, don't do it now. But if you're ever really bored, take the hymnal out of the back of the pew. And if you go to the back, you will see that the songs are listed by composer. And when you put Isaac Watts up against the, the uh, amount of work, the number of hymns that he writes, you put him up against the Wesleys and their neck and neck. And we recognize Charles and John Wesley as writing him after him after him after him. These great composers. Isaac Watts is equally as prolific. His name is just as not, not as well known. When he wrote this in 1719, so it, it is a song that we can sing. It's safe. It's 1719. It's officially old enough to sing. He wrote it because he was disapproving of the worship music that was used in the Church of England at the time. At that time, all music in the church was comprised of the psalms. They took the psalms and they set them to music and that was what they sang. They opened up the Psalter, they picked you know, Psalm 1, and they sang it back to God. Psalm 2, sang it back to God. And they would just rotate those over and over and over. Watts took a different perspective. He looked at that and he said, this is inadequate, inadequate for a people to limit themselves to just these words. Now, why would he say something like that? Why would somebody take the words of the Bible and say this is inadequate? It's inadequate for the same reason that when we sing songs too often, people stop paying attention. They become just words. It's like, oh, not this song again. And you kind of tune out for a few minutes and come back. You see, there's a danger in singing the same thing over, 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 over. You start to lose track of the words. The verses don't mean anything. You get to the chorus and it's just like, ah, blah, 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 blah. And so you see, we need to expand the way in which we praise God. So what Isaac Watts did was he said, I'm going to do exactly the same thing that the psalmist had done years ago. Because the psalmist had sat down and had written all this poetry in order to praise God. He had written all of these psalms in order to tell people and remind people and give them a way of remembering how to praise God, how to bank on the promises of God, how to call to God, how to do all these things. That's all contained in the Psalter. And so Watts said, I'm going to take the music of today which sounds weird, but the music of 1700s, I'm going to take the modern music of today and I'm going to write the words of the Psalms in a more modern tone. Joy to the World is Psalm 98 rehearsed in a different way. So if you have your Bible, open it up to Psalm 98. Let me read just the first few verses here. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of God. What a message of hope. What a promise in three verses of hope to come. That despite what a person is going through, despite whatever sickness, whatever trouble, whatever tragedy has come into their lives, that to recite those words is to set that aside and to know the hope of God, to know the fullness of the promises of God. 
And even when this is written, if you're not anticipating the Messiah coming, if you're not looking all the way down that road, you at least had hope for that day. You had hope for that moment. That no matter what you're facing, that God was still in control, that God still existed, that God would still exercise authority over all things, even those things that you were facing. Now Watts reads this, and he says, well, the essence of this message is joy to the Lord, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Now he takes a modification when we read the two together. You see, the psalmist here is looking forward in history. He doesn't anticipate the Messiah. He's looking for it, but he doesn't think that the Messiah is about to come. When Isaac Watts takes this song and he writes this song up here, he's looking backwards. Just look at that. This is what that meant. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let the earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. He has taken what's written in the Psalms and he has put it into, for him, modern language. And we hold the two up together. You and I can certainly memorize Psalm 98. We could sit and put our fullness of attention on Psalm 98 and I bet by next week we could all stand up and recite it together. Or we could play the first few notes of joy to the world and it would instantly come into your mind. The reason that this song was controversial was, well, hey, none of that hippie music in church. Okay? That was the first thing. He was bringing modern music, modern composers for the time into the church, and that, that wasn't good. But the second thing was he had a rival. He had a rival composer who would look for any opportunity to cut down Watts and say, no, 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 your music's no good. And this is what he said. He said, you're taking the Psalms of King David and you're rewriting them. You're rewriting them as though you yourself, Isaac Watts, think that you're King David. And Watts says, I'm nothing of the sort because I know the Lord has come as a fact. I'm not speculating. I'm not looking forward in history. I'm not doing anything. I'm saying that all the hope in the world, all the peace, all the joy, all the love, all of it was bound up in that moment when Jesus enters the world. The second half of the psalm reads like this. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy to the Lord the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the Lord, the world, and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the earth in righteousness and the peoples with equality. The psalmist sets forth the course of all history. All history. He says, one day the Lord will return. One day God is going to set everything right. One day, whether it's tomorrow or a million years in the future, one day everything is going to set right. And the whole world, the whole world, every bit of the world that is infected by sin, every tiny bit of the world that has been touched by sin, is going to rejoice. The oceans are going to sing. They're going to clap their hands. Everything in the world is going to rejoice at the sound of the Lord. Everything is going to praise God. Everything is going to know that hope has arrived. Every single thing is going to be made right. And Watts reads that. Watts reads that second half is heaven and nature. Heaven and nature sing. Heaven 
and nature praise the God of creation. Heaven and nature will praise the hope that is bound up in the Messiah. Heaven and nature will be set free one day. One day when sin is eradicated. When Jesus returns and says, this is the moment. Everything is going to celebrate. And you and I get this opportunity for four weeks out of the year. And I get this opportunity to pull these songs back forward, to pull these songs out, hear those first couple of notes, and just rejoice. Just begin to sing at the tops of our lungs. I love this last verse up here. I don't know if you can read that. But no more, no more let sin and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. You know how everybody in the world knows the first verse to this song. Everybody can sing all those words. But you, you, the people of God, can read that last verse, can sing that last verse, can lift your voices and let your hearts open up and sing that last verse because you know that hope. You know to look forward to the day when Jesus, in his second advent, in his second coming, you know that this is true. You know that everywhere that the curse of sin is found is going to be set free. Everything that is touched by sin is going to be restored. Every person Every person, every person who bears the image of God and bears the Spirit of God is going to be set free from the bondage of this world to feel no more pain, to cry no more, to mourn no more, but to live in the eternity of that joy to the world. And we just call these Christmas songs. We just call these Christmas songs. We, we put these songs away for 48 weeks every year. It's kind of a shame. It would be kind of refreshing, I think, in July to sing Joy to the World. It would seem unusual. We would uh, certainly not be wearing long sleeve shirts. We would be a little cooler. And, and rather than snow, we'd be complaining about the heat. But if we busted out Joy to the World, how refreshing would that be? Because although we call this a Christmas song, although we have named this a song that can only be sung between this day and this day, this is a sentiment for all time. This is a sentiment for every day of our life. This is a sentiment that embeds itself in your heart, in my heart, in the collective heart of the church for that moment when we want to pull it up and be reminded Joy to the world. The Lord has come. We get in the middle of this season, and it's easy to get swamped by the busyness. I know sometimes in a cranky moment, I will point out that Christmas seems to start the day after the back-to-school notebooks get put away. You go into the store, and no sooner has the Elmer's glue been swept <laughs> off to the side... And the Christmas stuff starts coming out, little by little by little. There is this constant drumbeat to extend the shopping season, buy more stuff, go do more things, go do all this. And you and I can get swept up in that. The busyness of the season can begin to draw us away from this simple thought of the joy to the world, to the simple thought of the Messiah coming. But it doesn't have to be that way. We can take this season and see it rather as a burden, because we have so many things to do, or see it as one of busyness. We've got to get this done, and this done, and this done, and this done. We can set all that aside, and we can see this as a moment of invitation. We can see us being called to know something, called to share a truth. We understand what this joy is all about. 
We understand what it means to sing joy to the world. The Lord has come. We understand that the Spirit can bring that thought up, can bring that understanding up within us. And that puts us in a unique position of privilege. You see, because while people all around us will be singing those words, people all around us will hear those words when they're shopping in late September. People will hear those words in their head and still not be able to understand what it means. But you do. The people of God understand what is bound up in just that first verse, just the truth of that. And it gives us a unique opportunity to take that song, to take something that people are familiar with and connect it to true hope. In a couple days, if you haven't already, you, you'll start getting Christmas cards from people, right? Christians, non-Christians alike. You'll start getting these cards, and on, on every other one, it'll be something about hope. It'll be something about joy. It'll be something about peace. It may actually be these words. And how many of our friends and our neighbor and, and our family, for that matter, are going to get these cards and go, yeah, joy to the world, and hang it up on the mantle or wherever you put Christmas cards. How many people will take maybe the most important statement, right, the thing that can change their life, and read it as just words? Oh, isn't that a nice Christmas card? And, and set it aside. But we can be that Christmas card. We can take and say, hey, I, I, I see you've got this card. It says, joy to the world. I see you've got something on your Christmas tree, a Snoopy ornament that says, you know, hope on it or peace or whatever. That's an opportunity for you to take what you know. It's an opportunity for you to take what you believe and share that. And share that in a way that can change people's lives. You can point out why we call this season Advent, what we're looking forward to. You can say boldly, I have a hope that no matter what we face, no matter what goes on in our life, I have a hope that everything is going to be set right. And you give them an opportunity to ask you, it's kind of biblical here, watch this. You give them an opportunity to ask you the source of your hope. What's the reason for the hope that you have? It's an enormous season of opportunity. And if you get that opportunity, if that door should open a little bit, you get an opportunity to tell people why we praise Jesus. Because a lot of people don't understand. To them, Jesus is this baby that's just born. And three guys come and find him. I mean, that's because it's over across the street in front of the supermarket here. That's, that's the story. Why do we praise Jesus? We praise Jesus because he brought us all kind of new rules. Right? Yeah. Well, you're shaking your heads. Oh, that's the wrong thing I said. I'm sorry. We praise Jesus because he didn't bring us a new system of rules. Jesus didn't bring a new structure and say, you need to do this and do this and do this and do this. And if you do everything correct, if you live up to my standard, then I'll like you until you mess up. And you say, Pastor, stop it because that's not what it says. But that's what people believe. That's what people think of when they think of Jesus. They say he's just a rule maker and he's a rule breaker. They say he came to, to, to make everybody obey. And Jesus came and said everybody obey when they love one another. Jesus says everybody will obey when they love God, when they love each other, when they love their family, when they love strangers, when they just generally love their neighbors. And when we've shared that Jesus with them, then we begin to show them what this hope is all about. The hope is not just that Jesus has come. The hope is not just that Jesus one day is going to return that second advent. The hope is this. The hope is bound up in the fact that whether we face a den of lions 
or some crippling disease or some enormous tragedy comes into our life, the hope is this, that we don't face the den of lions by ourselves. Jesus will be with us. We don't face disease by ourselves. Jesus says, I'm with you. I'm walking with you in this. We have hope. We have hope for one reason, and that is because Jesus says, I will never leave you. I will never leave you, no matter what you're facing, no matter what trouble, no matter what travail you've got in your life, I will go with you. And that's where the hope comes from. That's where the hope comes from. No matter how long it takes for Jesus to return, no matter how many years or minutes pass until his second advent, it doesn't matter because he's already with us. He has given his spirit to his people. He has quickened us. He has reignited our hearts and said, I will be with you. I will be with you no matter what you face. And that's the opportunity that we have. What is this joy to the world of which you speak? Let me tell you. The joy is that no matter what I have to face, no matter what I have to go through, Jesus is with me. What is this joy that you speak of? The joy is that no matter what comes into my life, no matter what change befalls me, no matter what I have to deal with, Jesus is with me. And he has told me, he has told me, he has made it known to all of us that he is in the process of setting everything right. And so if we with all creation have to groan for a little while, one day everything is going to be set free and we will sing this song, Joy to the World, We Knew It All Along. We Knew It All Along. Joy to the World, the Lord is come. That's the Jesus that we celebrate. That's the Jesus that all this book is about, that all those songs are about, that this entire season is about. And he's given us the privilege of singing it, of telling it, of sharing it, of showing it in our lives. That's an enormous privilege. When we understand joy in that context, when we understand that joy is not just an emotion, joy is not just happy, sad, that joy is that hope, that trust, that faith that, that stays with us no matter what we face. It changes the way that we view things. We look at this table. We look at the Lord's table every month. And we recount, we rehearse back what it represents. It represents the broken body, the shed blood of Jesus Christ on a cross. And the world says, how can you celebrate? How can you remember something as bloody and terrible and horrific as that? And we answer back because there's joy bound up in that. There's joy bound up in that. You see, that's, that's so unusual. That's how can you view something? You know, in the same way that Israel viewed the Exodus, it was awful, it was bloody, it was painful. It sent them out in the desert for decades. And yet they view it as that moment in which they were set free. We too look at the body of our Savior, of his crucifixion, a horrible crucifixion. And we realize that's the moment that we were set free. That Satan was bound. And Jesus says, watch this moment. Because things are going to happen faster and faster and faster. He says, once a month, do this for me. When joy is just an emotion, when it's just the difference between happiness and sadness, then this is just crackers and juice. It doesn't mean anything. But when you receive these elements this morning, 
If I could have the servers come forward and, and be really careful on this side, please. When, the, when, when we hold these elements in our hands, look up here. Look at the words of this song. You're going to be holding that joy in your hands. You're going to be holding that, that body and that blood in your hands. And you're going to realize this was given for you. It was given for you as a sacrifice, but it was given for you so that you would know hope and peace and joy. We go to the scriptures when we share in the Lord's table and often go to the Gospels and recount what Jesus says directly. We recognize that Jesus is sending, spending his last night with his disciples. He's spending that last night together and he wants, them to, give, wants to give them one more uh, wish of hope, one more thought that they can hang on to, knowing that he would separate from them for a time. And they were going to face something that they hadn't faced before. They may have thought in the back of their minds that uh, Jesus might die, that we might be separated from him. But they didn't really think about it. They hadn't really processed what it would mean for Jesus to actually be gone. And Jesus is telling them, I'm leaving, I'm gone. But whenever you're together, whenever you're together, remember this. Remember what this meant. And hold on to that hope. But instead of going to the Gospels, I want to go to the letter to the Corinthians. Because Paul is writing to a church that is in disarray. They've got troubles within the church. They've got separations of people. They've got people that are acting in ungodly ways. And in particular, they're acting in ungodly ways with regard to the Lord's table. They're certainly going through the motions, but they have forgotten what it meant. They have begun to look upon the Lord's table as just one more thing or as just a meal that we can conveniently go to. They have lost the hope. They have lost the purpose of celebrating this bloody, horrific thing. So when Paul writes, he's not looking forward as Jesus is. He's looking backwards. In essence, he's saying, remember. Remember who we are. Remember who you are. Remember who God says you are. Paul writes this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And together we take the bread. In the same way, after supper... He took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Together we take this. And he rounds it out by saying this. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And in the same way, when we pull these specific hymns or praise songs about Christmas, we remember the hope that is still to come. We remember the hope that we have today, the hope that we will have tomorrow, and the even greater hope that is promised to us on that day, somewhere in the future, in which Jesus will return again. Amen?